So, Craig, you've been an outspoken critic of the revolving door in D.C., particularly around media policy issues. Uh, you write for the Huffington Post and, of course, for Free Press. Um, what, what have we seen with uh, some of these FCC policymakers um, in their ro role with industry? Well, I mean, I think what we've seen is that Commissioner Copps here is the exception. You know, he's somebody who left the FCC, and there are a few others, and went and continued their work in public service. But unfortunately, I think far too many of his colleagues, former colleagues, have taken another path. And so at the most extreme end, you see somebody like Meredith Baker, who left her position at the FCC right after voting for one of the biggest media mergers ever, the mergers of Comcast and NBC, to take a job as a lobbyist for Comcast and NBC. You see former Chairman Michael Powell, now the head of the largest cable lobby uh, in the country, and, and it goes on down the line. And you also see a lot of people who, who did their time in public service, but who then left the agency to go work for powerful law firms, to go work for the powerful companies. And what I'm afraid it's left us with is an agency that at times is captured by industry. Uh, and a lot of people are looking for that next job uh, you know, while they've still got the old one. At least that's my concern. And, and so I think that, you know, we need to be, we need to be keeping an eye on that. And, and honestly, I would settle for that just being controversial again in Washington. I think a lot of those moves are just met with a shrug, like, oh, of course she went off to become a lobbyist for Comcast. I think that that's what the kind of thing that leads the American public to really mistrust a lot of their decision makers. And I would hope there's about to be another round of vacancies likely at the Federal Communications Commission. And I would hope that as the White House and the President are looking, that they're really looking toward people uh, truly committed to public service and who are going to sit in those very powerful chairs, use that very powerful bully pulpit to uh, look out for the public. There are shining examples like Commissioner Copps here, uh, Commissioner Adelstein when he was when he was there, many others who have, who have absolutely looked out for the public while they were sitting at the FCC. Unfortunately, there are others who I fear weren't really doing that. And you know the revolving door is, is not unique to the Federal Communications Commission. Right. There's a lot of other agencies of government, special trade representative where people go to work representing foreign governments. But the point, <coughs> the point is when we're talking about broadcasting, you're talking about a very special industry. You're talking about something that goes to the bloodstream of our democracy, the heart and soul of democracy, nourishing the civic dialogue. You're talking about the utilization of a public resource, which is the airwaves. There's not a company in the United States of America that owns one hertz of spectrum. The spectrum belongs to we, the people, mm -hmm. and they're given licenses to use it. And this is a resource that is the conduit for our civic dialogue, our small d democratic conversation with one another so we can make intelligent decisions for the future of our nation. And to subject that to this kind of revolving door is uh, even more dastardly than the revolving door as it applies to so many other uh, agencies. The Women's Media Center and others are saying maybe it's time for the first FCC chairwoman. Uh, certainly, um, Amen. <laughs> certainly uh, the uh, time that you spent on the commission was you were the, in the minority for for the majority for most of that time um, but but now we have uh, a second term of obama's presidency and we look at the the track record of the things he's um, said were his initiatives certainly the the campaign rhetoric as he was heading into office the first time around um, was very strong on media issues um, i mean how does that um, play out now i mean he's theoretically in a safe time. Could, couldn't he put Malkia Cyril from Center for Media Justice as the new chairwoman of the FCC? Well, with the advice and consent of the Senate, I'm not sure that would be uh, a likely uh, appointee. But I do think that, you know, whoever it is, you know, that the White House does have the opportunity to set expectations to actually go out and meet the public. Uh, and I think that's the, you know, Commissioner Copps talks about the public airwaves. It's so refreshing uh, as, you know, belonging to the public, a basic idea, but one that gets forgotten on the floors of the FCC, you know, talking about public interest obligations as not suggestions, they're obligations. And I think, you know, something Commissioner Copps always did was, was, as a public servant, actually go out and meet with the public. And so whoever takes this job next, I think that's their obligation, is to go out and engage and come into the job, not as a referee between giant corporations, but as the public's representative in that discussion. And I think there are a lot of qualified candidates. Some of them already work at the FCC, Commissioner Clyburn, Commissioner Rosenworcel, uh, many of the names that have been bounced around as possible successors to Chairman Janikowski. But what I hope the White House will be looking looking at is really who's going to utilize the power of this agency. We need someone who's going to use that bully pulpit. We need someone who's going to really work on behalf of the public. And we need someone who's willing to make the tough decisions that Congress is going to be unable to do, that is going to stand up to these companies, is going to look for public interest obligations, and isn't going to hope someone else will clean up the mess for them. And what the public interest community and the civil rights groups need to be doing right now is getting some commitments from that White House before 
a nomination is announced. If we wait to see, well, so-and-so has been announced, and then the White House calls up and says, well, you say something nice about this candidate, um, I, I want us to have commitments from the president reaffirming some of those promises he made when he was a senator and running for president. And I have uh, letters in my file still that he wrote to the Federal Communications Commission and statements that he made saying we should not be changing our media ownership rules until we better understand the consequences on the public interest, on minorities, on diversity communities, and we need to reassert the public interest. And I don't say that in an antagonistic way. We're halfway through his two terms. There's still plenty of time to do that. But it won't happen unless the public interest groups, the civil rights groups, and anybody who's listening to this show right now really go on record and make their voices heard. That's how we'll get some response. That's how we'll get some action, some forward movement. You're watching Free Speech TV. One of the things that we're excited to be about here in Denver is the National Con Conference for Media Reform, April 5th through the 7th. And uh, Free Speech TV will be broadcasting live. Um, this is uh, an opportunity not only to hear from you know talking heads and, and experts from inside D.C., which is really important for those of us around the country, um, but also uh, to, to mix and mingle with artists, activists, and uh, academics. It seems like uh, of all these conferences, this is sort of the, the most edgy and innovative um, after after you guys have done these for several years? Well, you know, speaking as a talking head from Washington, D.C., <laughs> I think that uh, it really is a unique kind of event, and it's the kind of event that brings together people from all across the country, thousands of them, who are the person in their community working on the media issues. They're the person in their community who's trying to start a community radio station, and really shows them that they're, they're not alone out there, and that there are a lot of people who really care about these media issues, and they're growing by the millions to recognize that addressing the problems of the media, talking about the future of the internet, these are issues that are going to play a role in whatever issue you care about. Is it, is it labor? Is it feminism? Is it the environment? How the media covers those issues, what they decide to cover and not cover, has a tremendous amount of influence about the outcome of those debates. And so if we can involve people in these media debates, uh, I think we'll see a benefit for all kinds of social movements. And so what we're hoping to do at this conference is bring together a lot of those people all in one place. And you know, yes, there's plenty of discussion about media policy and this and that, but there's also going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be parties. There's going to be uh, opportunities to meet and mingle with people from all the country. And I, and I think most people will tell you that it is not like other conferences because the sessions are full. There's hands-on opportunities. You want to learn how to build your own radio station? We'll do that. You want to learn the ins and outs of internet policy? We'll do that too. Uh, you want to dance with some fun people from across the country, <laughs> hopefully we'll create that opportunity. I think Commissioner Copps is already committed to that. So. <laughs> and local, it's, it's local a, artists from here in Denver, uh, uh, members of Devochka and Flowbots, mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course stand-up comedy this year, which is real exciting. That's right. you gotta, you got to laugh, sometimes to keep from crying. but uh, something. It's the best media event there is, and when I was a commissioner, that was the one event I always enjoyed most doing was coming out here. Because what you have when you get here is uh, several thousand people who come in from around the country, reformers, they didn't get here by using a business expense account right. uh, or writing it off. They got in by jumping in a van and five or six or seven of them driving to, uh, driving to Denver. So it's fun people and it's a wonderful opportunity if each one of those four or five thousand people, or however many come, goes back and contacts fifteen or twenty people back home, then you've got a mass movement going on. Then you can make a difference in some of these public interest policies that we've been discussing. Yeah, it seems like the one last thing I want to try to cover, if we have time, is the the, the constant threats to funding for public media mm -hmm. and community media. Um, it, it was amazing to see the response to the the threat to Big Bird during the sure. campaign last year. But but isn't there? Um, a more substantive discussion than than Jim Lair laughing at his network going away? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think there needs to be. And, and it, the lesson I take away from all these fights is every time Congress comes to try to cut the funding for public media, the public rises up. It happened when Newt Gingrich tried to do it in 1996. It happened in 2005. It happened in 2010. And you saw in what was otherwise, frankly, a disastrous debate for the president, uh, the one issue that stood out was this attack on Big Bird. And people mobilized in the hundreds of thousands and millions to say, don't touch public media. So when I look at that landscape, I think, you know what, public media is a winning issue. All the attempts to cut it have failed, and yet what has succeeded is, is continue to put it in this like ever-shrinking box where we have to fight over essentially table scraps. We f spend far less than the rest of the world when it comes to public and community right. media. It's like $1.35 per capita. In England, it's $80. In Canada, it's 20 In the Scandinavian countries, it's, it's far more. 
And we don't, we're not necessarily going to get to those levels, but if we invested at $5 per capita per year, something like that, we could put tens of thousands of journalists back to work. We could end the turf battles between community radio stations and PBS and NPR and outlets like Free Speech TV. You know, they're all part of the non-commercial public media universe, and we need to support it. And there's been no more important time to do that because I don't know of a better answer to the crisis in journalism. There's an existing network out there that could plug in and do local quality news and information. It's the public media system, but if we want that to exist, we're going to have to invest on it. Uh, frankly, I think it's a bargain, but I think that's the fight we need to have in the years ahead, and that's the kind of political coalition we need to start to put together to say, you know what, surveys tell us that spending on public media is the best use of federal money than anything except for the national defense. And yet we spend a pittance. Uh, and I think this is a, there's a real opportunity to look at the fights of the last few years and say, you know what, let's get off defense uh, and let's start actually asking for something more. Yeah, what, what is your vision for um, uh, not just uh, media and democracy reform, but, but the, the potential light at the end of the tunnel if we could fix some of these problems and stop defending the little bit of funding that you know public broadcasting gets? I mean, what, what, what to you would be a vision of a more robust media, certainly more diverse, um, but uh, I don't know, do you have kind of a vision for uh, where this work is going? Well, I have a vision of, of public interest broadcasting that applies to both commercial and to uh, and to public uh, television, where we have some guidelines for commercial broadcasters to try and bring back some of the localism, some of the local news, covering local cultures, covering local diversity. And I think the FCC has the authority to do that, to put some, some guidelines in place. I agree wholeheartedly with Craig. We need to have a vibrant discussion about the future of public media in this country. We really have a problem uh, with our news and information infrastructure. It's a hollow shell of what it used to be and it's a serious problem uh, because it really goes to our ability to sustain a civic dialogue that has enough depth and breadth of information that we the people have the information we need to make intelligent discussions for the future of the country. America's in a deep hole right now in, in many, many respects, many, many problems. There's no get out a whole free card for the United States of America. Not going to happen automatically. It's only going to happen when people understand these issues and that's the responsibility of media, commercial, non-commercial, uh, everybody out there, new media, traditional media, to uh, to fill that void. And if not, we are toying with the, the very uh, uh, vibrancy, the very existence of, uh, of the kind of dialogue you have to have to sustain self-government. You talked about uh, uh, the gap between what we spend on defense and what we spend on our news and information infrastructure. There was a time when we spent as much on sustaining the news and information infrastructure as we spent on defense. It was back in the time of George Washington and James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, who were struggling to build a new country in this experiment in self-government, they, uh, they didn't have any guarantee that that was going to work. They didn't know, and they said, we have to get news and information out to the American people. So what did they do? They built postal roads at government expense, that infrastructure. They subsidized the mailing of newspapers. Of, and it wasn't objective journalism or neutral journalism. They were sending out partisan, because that's all there was at the time. But they said, get it all out there, give people whatever you've got, and they'll make intelligent decisions for the uh, future of the country. And that was either the, 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 it was either a little bit more than we spend on national defense or a little bit less. I don't know, but it was a huge amount of money. And I always add a postscript to this discussion. These are the same people who wrote the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. So when you try to have this conversation with uh, the talking heads of cable and all, they'll say, oh, you're playing fast and loose with the First Amendment. Uh-uh. The people who saw this void, who filled the void, who, who sustained uh, and, and, and subsidized the news and information infrastructure, the very same people that wrote that First Amendment, because the purpose of that amendment was to make sure that we had a news and information environment where people would have what they needed to make intelligent decisions. And an informed populace will create democracy. Yeah. Uh, Michael Copps from uh, Common Cause, the senior advisor to the Media and Democracy Reform Initiative. Craig Aaron, uh, CEO and president of Free Press. Um, looking forward to seeing you all again at the, uh, at the conference here in Denver, April 5th through the 7th. Uh, you've been watching Free Speech TV. I'm Gavin Dahl from Alternative Radio. Thanks so much.